So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Petros Kumutsakos, and it's uh, uh, my great pleasure um, for my first introduction to the Institute of Applied Computational Science to have the honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Caroline Uller. Um, I would like to say a few words. Um, Caroline is an associate professor at MIT, but uh, she was born in Switzerland and she studied mathematics and she earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics in 2004 and then she earned a second bachelor's degree in biology uh, both from the University of Zurich and then she did a master's degree in uh, mathematics. Then uh, that was not enough, uh, then she did also the credentials to get uh, to become a high school mathematics teacher and for those of you who do not know I had some of my PhD students do that. It's an extremely rigorous education and uh, it actually takes about a year of a lot of work, but at the same time, high school teachers are almost paid as university professors in Switzerland, <laughs> which is actually a great thing. So that their education pays off. Um, but then instead of uh, following the high school teaching, uh, she did other great things. Uh, Caroline then, she, uh, she went to the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and then, of course, she, uh, she would never do only one thing. So she, she did a PhD uh, in statistics, and then she did also a degree in management of technology from the Haas School of Business. And she worked with uh, Bert Strumfels in, in getting her, um, her PhD. Then after that, uh, she moved to back to Austria, and, and well, back to Austria. She moved back to Central Europe and to neighboring Austria, where she was at the Institute of Science and Technology in uh, 2011. Um, and then after that, uh, I'll skip a few steps and say that since 2015, um, she's a, a, a Henry and Grace Doherty professor at MIT, at MIT uh, where she's in the Department of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science, and at the Institute of Data Systems and uh, Society. Um, Caroline uh, has received Several awards. Uh, she's a Simons investigator, a Sloan Research Fellow, an electric member of the International Statistical Institute, and she has also received the NSF Career Award, uh, the Sofia Kovaleskaya Award, and the Humboldt Foundation and the START Award uh, from the Austrian Institute of Science and Technology. So uh, we're very excited to uh, have you here today. Uh, welcome, and uh, we're all looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Petros, for this very kind introduction. Um, I think all of this just means that for a long time I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I was very interested in many different things, so <laughs> it's good to explore um, if you are in this position, I think. Great, so um, let me get started. So uh, the group, I mean, we work a lot on causality and have worked a lot on causality in recent years, and in particular at the intersection of machine learning statistics and genomics, so always motivated by particular biological applications. And now due to, um, you know, the recent crisis in COVID-19, actually, the group has mainly worked on applications related to COVID-19. So what I'm going to present here is a very recent paper actually just came out two days ago um, on drug repurposing. Um, and in particular, I just want to show you all of this really exciting math that goes into, um, you know, building such a platform for drug repurposing for COVID-19. And so that's mainly um, around autoencoders and around causality. So that's the goal. And um, what I'll start off with is just a little bit about, you know, drug development and drug repurposing in general. Um, and so, you know, if you think about drug development against COVID-19, well, we all know how long it takes and how risky it is to actually develop drugs from scratch. And so really in a situation like this, where, you know, the urgency is so high with so many people dying, um, there is really only one viable approach, which is drug repurposing, where you try to identify drugs that are already FDA approved for other diseases that might also be beneficial um, in the setting of COVID-19. And so this is really helpful because, you know, you don't have to go through the safety and dosing trials anymore. Um, these have already been passed. And so you can move directly to trials where you're actually testing whether, you know, these drugs are really also have an effect on in the setting of COVID-19. Um, so how do drugs work in general? So many drugs or drugs usually um, target or try to target a particular protein. And often they make this protein um, 
in this case, like they make it so that it inhibits the protein so, so that uh, it cannot perform its downstream roles anymore. Um, and so how should you think about what kinds of proteins are good targets? Well, you want to target proteins whose downstream who have a downstream effect on many genes that are dysregulated by the disease. Right. So that there is a hope of like if you target this particular protein, then you can maybe get the genes that are downstream that are dysregulated by the disease back to the normal state. OK. And so you already see something that is, you know, I'm talking about things downstream, et cetera. Right. There is regulation. So this is kind of where the causal uh, structure comes in. Right. You want to target proteins or downstream. There are the genes that are dysregulated by a particular disease to put them back uh, to the normal state. Um, and so, you know, most drugs um, have been identified experimentally, right? But there is more and more actually computational approaches also to drug discovery. Um, and there are in fact some examples of drugs that have been, that have gone through the whole process and were identified computationally. And so then the question is, what are the, the data sets that are available to actually um, do uh, drug development from a computational perspective? And so they're really fun data sets and I'll talk more about them um, during the talk. But I'll here propose or, or talk about two different approaches um, that have been pursued um, and which will come up also later in the talk. And so one of them is to use this, you, you know, really large scale drug screening data that are available where you have thousands of FDA approved drugs and actually many other, you know, small molecules that have not been approved yet and many other genetic, et cetera, perturbations as well. So you actually have millions of different perturbations, um, but let's just take the 1000 FDA approved ones um, for, for the particular application where we want to repurpose drugs. And then on the other axis, you have um, different cell types. Okay. So, why is that important? So if you think about the human body, then in fact, most diseases only affect a particular tissue, right? So for example, for SARS-CoV-2, you really care about the lung. And in particular, you care about these long epithelial cells, which seem to be the ones that are you know, most affected, or at least at the beginning affected. And then there are all kinds of other cell types that are also affected. Um, but the thing is, drugs have different effects on different cell types. OK, so it is really important to actually have, you know, this a matrix of, you know, many different drugs or interventions applied to different cell types. Now, of course, we cannot apply it to all possible different cell types that you care about. In particular, you know, when there is a new disease like SARS-CoV-2, then you would have to redo this whole screen and apply it to SARS-CoV-2 infected lung epithelial cells. Right. Um, but there are certain cell types, in particular, actually, these data sets that are available are based on um, different cell lines in cancer. OK, so you have and these are around in this particular um, data set that I will be showing you is it's known as CMAP. It's from the Broad Institute. Um, there are about 70 or so different cell lines um, or different cell types, um, and they are actually all related to, to cancer cell lines. Um, and so on these, you have like, you know, many of these drugs, not all of them, you should think about it as a sparse matrix. I'll actually show it to you later. You have some of these entries, right, where you see what is the effect of a particular drug on one of these cell lines. Okay, so now then what do you want to do? Well, you want to take the cell type or cell line that you care about, and you would like to find the drug whose effect is basically pushing you back to the normal state again. Right. So you have you can now measure right the effect of without the drug and with the drug. And what you would like to find is a drug that actually pushes you back from diseased state of this cell type back to normal state of this cell type. Now, the problem is, as I just said, that, you know, drugs have different effects on cell types. So what you really need to be able in order to do this is to generalize to, to figure out what is the effect of a drug that then will generalize across different cell types because usually that particular disease cell type that you care about is not in this database. Okay, so you would need to figure out what is the effect of this drug um, in some space where hopefully you can then actually predict what the effect of this drug is on the cell type, disease cell type that you actually care about. Okay. So that's, but the one approach um, that is standardly used is, you know, to actually figure out what is the effect of a drug, figure out what is the effect of the disease, and then just, you know, try to find the drug that is most anti-correlated with the disease. Okay, so that's um, known as the signature matching. So you match the signature of a disease with the signature of a drug, and hopefully, you know, you can find the drug that just pushes you back to the normal state. Okay, so that's one approach. Um, then another approach that is also very, very, um, you know, heavily used is based on networks. 
Um, so here is another data set that is, you know, very um, widely available and freely available. And these are these networks that are these protein-protein interaction networks in humans. So which proteins that appear in the human body will interact with which other proteins? Now note that these are usually not cell type specific, okay? So these networks, you know, they, they're, they don't contain that kind of information in this particular cell type, which proteins will actually appear and which ones will not is actually not in, included. So it's just a general network of which proteins could interact with which other proteins. And now here, what you usually take is, so now I want to find the protein that would be a good target for a particular disease. Well, so you take data, and that's usually some of the first data that is available is, you know, in disease cells versus, or in SARS-CoV-2 infected cells versus not infected cells, what is the gene expression profile that changes? Okay, so you know which genes are actually now misregulated by the disease um, as compared to the healthy state. And now you match, you know, from genes to proteins and you, you have like this big, um, big graph on say 20,000 nodes, you have to, humans have 20,000 genes. And you know, you know, these genes here, you can actually color them like what I did here, the red and the blue ones, these are now misregulated in the disease. You know, some are now more up in the disease versus the healthy state, some are more down in the disease versus the healthy state. So you have your misregulated genes. And then the standard approach is to try to find a protein that is, you know, connected to as many of these misregulated genes or as central as possible in this subnetwork where there is a lot of misregulated genes. And then you would say, hey, this might be a good target, right? Because it is connected to all these other genes around it and they are all misregulated. Now that's the standard approach. Now there is a bit of a problem and I kind of alluded to it before. You know, these are all undirected edges, right? So if your regulatory network actually looks like this, yes, here is a node that has, that is connected to many misregulated genes, all these red and blue guys. Um, but you know, if these genes all have an effect on this particular protein here, then targeting this one will not change anything, right? It will not have any effect on all of the misregulated genes around it. It only really works or it has a chance of working if actually the network looks like this, right? Where you have this protein here, which has um, an, a causal effect on all the other um, nodes around it. And so if you target this green guy here, then the, at least there is a hope that maybe it could push back the other uh, nodes around it. So it is really important here, you know, when you're thinking about a drug as an intervention in the system, right, that you actually need to know the directions, otherwise you, um, you can't really say, you know, um, which other nodes are actually going to change. Um, so it is super important that we actually move away from just these undirected um, graphs to actually get something causal. Okay, so these are somehow two challenges that I'll talk about. Um, so one is this challenge and I'll, I described it here. Um, so let me start with a second one because this is the first one that I described. So one is this challenge where, you know, you have a drug and you know its effect on a particular cell type. So the drug is now this yellow, right? It's an intervention. So say it targets this protein, this protein, this protein. So you have a drug, it is, and you know its effect on one cell type, say this pink cell type. But what I really want to do is try to predict the effect of this drug on a different cell type, namely the one I care about. Okay, so how do I get drug signatures that generalize across different cell types so that then I can actually figure out a drug that will actually work on my SARS-CoV-2 infected cells and not on some cancer cell line, right, that I might not actually care about right now. Um, and then the other thing is that um, you then want to go in. So now you have like a list of drugs and now you actually want to validate their mechanisms as well. And so now, or, or the mechanisms of these targets, and you maybe want to even more prioritize among these drugs. And so for that, you really want to actually understand the underlying regulatory system, right? And I want to be able to predict, you know, this is how this gene regulatory network looks like. Well, I really like this particular drug because it is actually upstream of, you know, all of these genes that have actually been misregulated um, by the disease. Okay, so you can use these protein-protein interaction networks as a prior, but then you actually want to develop methods, and this is something that we've spent a lot of time in recent years, develop methods for actually learning from the data causal relationships. So to get these actually edge directions out that are causal, that can predict what happens when you actually perform a particular intervention. Okay, so these are the two points. Now, these will be two separate talks. I'll mainly talk about um, the second one and then just a little bit about the third one in the application itself. Um, Okay, so let's do the second one. Um, so I have a drug, I have these big, um, you know, data sets of drugs applied to some cell types, and I want to be able to predict the effect of a drug on a different cell type. Okay, so, um, 
So we have in the lab come to really love autoencoders, and I know Petros does as well. And we have worked together on a project where we actually used autoencoders in the physics context. Um, and so I will be using and talking a lot about autoencoders here. Um, so if you come from machine learning, then there is a very maybe natural approach for trying to do this. Um, in particular, if you're thinking about how do people, you know, take an image. So the drug could be a style, right? I have drug one, I have drug two, I want to apply it to a particular image, uh, or I want to apply it to a particular cell type. Well, so maybe I could see it as, you know, you take an image, which would be my cell type uh, in winter, and now I want to apply the drug that makes it look like summer. Um, so that's a style transfer kind of question. And I see there are questions. Please just interrupt me if there is any question. You too. Okay, probably not to me. <laughs> I don't know what you two means. Okay, um, <laughs> so let me continue. Um, so um, yeah, so so you know, if you if you come from a machine learning background, then you know all this work of you know I have some people. Often it's also GAN and not an autoencoder, but I'll be using autoencoders. You know, you have some people in your training set where you have a natural face and you have a smiley face. Um, and so you autoencode these into this latent space, right? And you figure out what is this vector that corresponds to adding a smile. And now comes a new face. I put it into the latent space and I want to add a smile to this person. So I will take this vector and move it over in the latent space um, to this point here, and then move this point wherever I come out back to the you know, image space and wow, out comes a smiley face. Okay, so this person now with a smile. So this is known as style transfer, right? This has been like super, um, you know, super successful. Also, you've, I'm sure you've seen these really nice images of like, um, you know, not nice natural scenes and then in the summer and then you can transport them to becoming the same scenes in the winter, etc. cetera. Um, and so you can think of the same kind of approach as, you know, this now here is cell type one, okay, is this cancer cell line where I have the cancer cell line before the drug and after the drug. So this would be before drug, after drug. So I can figure out what the effect of this drug is. Now comes the cell type that I actually care about, SARS-CoV-2 infected um, long epithelial cells. I don't know what the effect of the drug is, but let me just assume that, you know, here I have the effect of this drug in a different cell type. Maybe I can just move it over, apply it here, and then out comes actually the cell type and what would happen when you would apply the drug. Okay, so that's quite an intuitive approach if you come from a machine learning perspective. And in fact, this has been, and it's qu really quite nice that it has been applied. Um, and now uh, I have to remember, I think this was um, one drug and two or three different cell types, um, and it was actually validated. Okay, so for this particular um, drug, you know, it was actually possible to, um, to move it over um, using these standard autoencoders. Now, okay, so this was kind of surprising to me that something like this could work coming from a causality perspective. Now, you know, these things here kind of, I mean, it seem intuitive that they could work, but not when you're talking about drugs. So drugs are very different than actually adding winter or summer. Um, so because a drug is an intervention. So in general, right, there is not a drug that will push me back from the drugged state to the normal state. So in general, I can go right from an observational distribution, I can apply an intervention, I get to the interventional distribution. In general, there is no, no intervention that can push me back to the observational state. And in fact, there is um, work um, and a long, actually a lot of work by Barenboim, Pearl and co-authors and you know, many different papers where they have necessary and sufficient conditions for something which is known as causal transportability, which is exactly this. So when can I figure out what the effect of a, of, um, a causal intervention is in a different system? Okay, so I know the effect of an intervention in one, in one environment, say cell type, what is the effect of, a, of this particular intervention in a different environment? Now they require to know the full causal structure, like which variables are affected by which others and which variables in fact determine um, which environment you're in, et cetera. But it is if and only if conditions, okay? So it's not the case that you can just expect this to work in general. Um, and so the question is like, you know, why does it work? And, and also should we expect this to work in general? And so now, since we have these large scale drug data sets, um, let's actually see if this works in general. And in fact, I'll show that this doesn't work in general, okay? So, um, and then we have to think about, well, how could we maybe make this work in general? 
or maybe more generally, I still don't think that it will always work. Um, and so that's where we need to understand autoencoders a bit better. And so I just want to um, go through what this autoencoder is. I know, I'm sure, you know, people here are very familiar with autoencoders, but I want, there are some points that I really want to make before we get a little bit more into the theory of these. Um, so this autoencoder is a map, right, which goes from, say, RD to RD. Okay, so it goes from the same input space to the same output space. And in, usual, in general, how autoencoders have been defined, at least how they have been introduced, is you go through this latent space and the latent space is usually lower dimensional than the, than the input and output space. So this is used for finding an informative lower dimensional representation of the data, okay? And the autoencoder is trained in such a way, so this is a neural network and this is a neural network. You have two parts, two neural networks, one encoder, one decoder. It is trained in such a way so as to minimize the reconstruction error between what goes in and what goes out, okay? So you see like this face here should look very much like the face that comes out. This is what it was trained to do. And you know, that's how you found actually this informative representation here. So you can think of it as some nonlinear version of PCA, right? Which tries to retain somehow the important information that is required in order to reconstruct your training images. Um, and so this is the autoencoder that, you know, the standard autoencoder that people um, understand as an autoencoder was actually used in this particular application down here. And so let's see if this actually works in general on these very large scale drug data sets. And I'll show you that this usually doesn't work. So you shouldn't expect these standard autoencoders just to work, to trans uh, transfer between the effect of drugs. Um, and so let me show you this. And here I'm going into the data set. Okay, so this is a really exciting data set. I think, you know, everyone should know about it. And I just see that I don't have my pen here. Okay. Um, so um, everyone should, you know, know about it. It's just really exciting to play around with it. It's a CMAP data set. It's really available at the Broad. And how you can think about it is, um, so it has, um, so in this case, the rows, the 1.2 million samples of different kinds of perturbations applied to about 70 or so different cell types. So this would be my columns. Um, and every entry is a 1000 dimensional vector. So that's, um, you know, the, so here, instead of 20,000 genes, 1000 genes um, were selected. And so what you measure is, you know, what happens when you apply a particular drug to that particular um, cell line and you measure these 1000 genes. Okay, so here what you see is among all these different perturbations, so in this case, there are like 20,000 different perturbations and all the different cell types you see that there are some few perturbations that were applied to basically all cell types. And there were some few cell types where most perturbations were applied to. Okay, but all of this white space is missing, right? So this would mean this particular perturbation or drug was not applied to this particular cell type. Okay, so that's um, what this, this is how the data set looks like. What you see over here is just a U map of the data set. So we take these 1000 dimensional vectors and we just plot them. And the colors are based on the different cell types. And in black are perturbational or not perturbational data. We're not distinguishing between all the different perturbations. This is mainly for you to see that every, you know, these are all the perturbations that were actually performed on this particular cell type. So what you see is that the variability between cell types is much bigger than, you know, if I, if I um, apply a particular drug on a cell type, you're going to have a very, very small effect. Okay, so the effect of uh, applying a perturbation still usually leaves you within the variability of the cell type itself. So effects of drugs are really quite small as compared to differences between different cell types. Um, so, but this is the data. So certainly here I have, I have say, you know, quite a few, say I can take two cell types where most of the drugs were applied and I can just test this, right? I can just, oops, sorry. I can just um, test this kind of framework because I can take two cell types where, you know, thousands of drugs were applied to both of these cell types. And I can just see whether I can transport, you know, this, this vector here, right? Would be, would correspond to the effect of drug one on cell type one. This vector here would correspond to the effect of drug one on cell type two. And I just want to know whether they are actually aligned. So I can just measure the correlation and I can see whether this alignment is bigger in the latent space as if I were just doing it in the 1000 dimensional original space. 
because otherwise, you know, if it was bigger before, then it really doesn't, or it's the same in the latent space as before, then it doesn't make any sense to embed the data, right? Because I want to embed it in order to be able to generalize, to move over between different kinds of cell types. Um, so I see something in the chat, um, Alex, okay, perfect. Thanks, Alex, for being here. Um, so perturbation effect is even small as compared to variation within a type, not just between. Correct. Small as compared to variation within a type. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So let me actually explain that a bit better. Um, so, so here, what you see is, and you know, I didn't, you can't, cannot kind of not color everything. So all the perturbations are in black, but what you see here is the effect of a perturbation on this particular cell type is very small as compared to the effect, as compared to the variability just within that particular cell type itself. Yes, so not even between. So the effect of perturbing within a cell type will fall within the variation of that cell type in general. Yes, and there are more questions. Oh, okay, perfect. Also feel, I don't know if you can, but otherwise feel free to just speak up. Um, I don't know if that's allowed here or not. No, not allowed, okay, thanks. Okay. Um, you can certainly raise your hand though, if you'd like to also. Okay, perfect, thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm very happy if you ask questions. Thanks, Alex, for you know starting off everyone with questions. Hopefully, others will follow. <laughs> so okay, um, so now let me actually show you some results, um, just to show you that this in general doesn't work with a standard autoencoder. Um, and so this is all I'm doing, right? I'm taking a drug in the two cell types that have the most data, and I just look at the alignment of the effect of a drug, right, which was measured in both cell types. Um, and see whether the alignment is bigger in the latent space or whether, or is it just similar as what it was in the original space, meaning it doesn't really make sense to use an autoencoder. Okay, and since I have a lot here, I wanted to explain it beforehand. Um, so here would be, we just took the two cell types, cell lines that have the most drugs applied to them. Okay, and so we look at all drugs that were applied to these. And what you see here is, the alignment in the latent space. So you see, this is a correlation, right? The correlation can be between minus one and one. If they're aligned, it should be either, right? There should be data either down here or up here. Um, and this is the alignment in the, in the late. So this is the original space and this is in the latent space. Again, this goes from minus one to one. So if they were very well aligned, what you would expect, and now, would really love to have my pen. Now, you, what you would expect is to have a whole lot of data, a whole lot of points here, and a whole lot of points here, right? That would mean that in the latent space, it is better aligned than in the original space. But what you see, and I'll explain what all these other things are, and this will motivate actually why we're looking at these particular autoencoders. What you see here when you use your standard autoencoders, they go from, you know, high dimensional space, 1000 dimensional space to a lower dimensional space back to the high dimensional space. That's the standard autoencoders. You see that these points basically fall along the diagonal, meaning that you know, it doesn't really matter whether you're embedding it or not, but you do have here some that actually work out better, right? Where you have better alignment. Um, now, of course, with an autoencoder that goes through a lower dimensional space, you always lose something in terms of data, right? So you, you shouldn't believe that, and, and there is no reason to believe that you'll get full reconstruction. So you are losing a little bit of information, but you do get a little bit out here that you actually have a little bit better alignment. Now, just to compare that to what, what would happen if you just do PCA. So if you, oh, sorry, down here is PCA. So if you do PCA, what you do, and we just use the two first principal components, you can actually get really good alignment. Okay, I can get really, really good alignment, um, but I do that by, well, removing basically all of the information because I'm just using the first two principal components. Okay, so if you throw away basically all of the signal, then that's one way of getting really good alignment, kind of makes sense. And so here is what I'm going to propose and what I'll also tell you where the intuition comes from. That will be the main talk of actually the theory of like why we even thought about applying something like this. Um, so here, I think you get the best of both worlds is that actually even better, right? So you get full reconstruction, and I'll tell you what this is. You get full, complete reconstruction. Um, you're not losing any information at all, and we're getting better alignment, okay? And so now the question is, what is this? And it's also an autoencoder. It's just a very strange autoencoder that, you know, is maybe not what, what you would 
or is an unintuitive one. It doesn't really make sense at the first in the first um, pass through. And then I'll give you the theory that actually motivated looking at this. Um, so what we're going to do is this crazy autoencoder where we're going to go from this 1000 dimensional space into a larger dimensional space and then back to the 1000 dimensional space. Okay, so we're going to use an autoencoder to actually embed into a larger dimensional space. Now, this is strange and people haven't done it um, because, you know, if you go into a larger dimensional space, you could actually just learn the identity map, right? So I have enough parameters to just learn the identity map of going from this 1000 dimensional space to myself by just completely, you know, just mapping every point to itself. But obviously it's not that the autoencoder learned the identity map because otherwise it would, you know, all of the points would come out here along the diagonal then the latent space would just be the same as the original space. So we see that the autoencoder did not learn the identity map, right? It actually learned something that we want. It actually <laughs> learned some embedding that where, you know, these, these, um, the effect of these drugs were actually more aligned than in the original space. But it does this without actually losing, it can fully recover every one of the training examples, right? Because we have so many parameters. Well, you'll, you'll be able to get to loss zero um, but the question is really, well, where did this intuition come from? And what is the map that is actually being learned by an autoencoder, right? Why is it the case that these overparameterized autoencoders, where you actually map into a larger dimensional latent space, what are they actually doing and why is this something useful? Okay. And so this then allows you to generalize across cell types. And I'll get back to this application in the end. Um, but I think here is where I want to just, you know, go off into actually talking about the theory of autoencoders and what even motivated us to look at these very strange autoencoders. And before I go there, there are questions and I will take all of these. Um, uh, okay, so there is a question about 100. Oh, yeah. So what happens with different uh, principal components if I don't just do two, but if you actually do 100 principal components and there is a plot here. Um, so you see what happens with 100 principal components, you're getting closer and closer what is kind of what you should expect to the original one. Okay, but um, what is interesting is so this this overparameterized autoencoder. So first, yeah, so so you'll you'll so the overparameterized autoencoder does what you would want to, but then the other one actually changes the shape much quicker to, to become more like the original data space. So the problem with PCA is you, you get the same alignment, right? Even with 100 or so, you'll, you'll at some point, like maybe it's 50 is the right threshold, you would get the right alignment, but you're doing it by losing information from your data set. Um, whereas you see here that we're never, right? Because we're overparameterized, we'll never actually lose any information. Then there are questions about how do you train this kind of autoencoder? Um, yes, and we'll get to that. But yes, we are only using reconstruction loss. Caroline, um, I answered that offline and he's happy. Oh, I see. Yeah. OK, so then I just go on. Uh, Stephen had a question. I don't know if you see. Ah, yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, yeah, no problem. Um, and this, I'll actually get into. That's exactly the right questions uh, to ask. And that's what I want to tell you now, the theory about it. Um, so let's go into the theory. Okay, so let me give you some intuition for why this is happening and, and what is it actually that we're training. Okay, so um, we have N training examples, say now, and sorry, they live in RK instead of in RD. Um, and we're in the overparameterized setting. Let's say, you know, the number of samples is actually smaller than the input dimension, or you can just embed into a larger dimensional space. Doesn't really matter. It's the same. Um, all I mean by overparameterized is that I can get the training error down to zero because I have enough parameters to get the training error down to zero. Okay. And so what I'm going to analyze when I'm doing the theory, when I'm implementing everything, it's standard, you know, stochastic gradient descent, standard autoencoders, et cetera, like UNET, the autoencoder, um, and you'll see which ones I'm using. And we, you know, change how we optimize, et cetera, and we show that it really doesn't matter on what, what you're doing. When I'm, when I'm doing the theory, all we're analyzing is always just gradient descent, okay? And it's gradient descent initialized that's a, as close to zero as you can. Um, and so what does an autoencoder do? So what an autoencoder does is this is the neural network. It's the map, right? It takes in a training example. It spits out psi of xi. And all it tries to minimize is reconstruction error. That was exactly the question. Okay, so I'm trying to minimize reconstruction error. 
So psi of xi minus xi should be as close as possible to zero. And I'm doing this over all training examples. Now, if I'm overparametrized, I already know that here I'll get out zero, okay? Um, and so now the question is, well, you know, there are many maps, right? Many maps psi that can exactly interpolate the data. But the question is, which is the function that is actually learned by an autoencoder? Um, and sorry, there are more questions. And I think this is really important to, okay, so we're all good. Um, so this is really important um, to get across. So, I, and I would love you to ask a question. So let's just go through this for the particular example of one training example, okay? And let's do it for a linear map um, and a linear map, like really just a linear map, not, you know, a linear autoencoder. Um, so just, you have one example. So here I don't have a sum, uh, a sum. I just have one XI, okay? And my Psi is just matrix multiplication. Okay, so say this matrix psi is matrix A, and here I have X. So all I'm doing is I'm looking at A times X minus X, and I'm minimizing the two norm of that. Okay, so if X is say in RK, right, where K is larger than one, um, then there are many solutions that will give you A times X minus X is equal to zero. One solution is the identity, namely the identity times X minus X gives zero. Um, but there are many other solutions, right, that do this as well. In particular, right, the projections will do this as well, right, where, where it just maps every point, for example, to X itself. And um, will also, even the point map, right, which will map everything to X itself, will also give zero reconstruction error, right, on the training example. And so the question is, what does the neural network actually do? Which ones of these many solutions does it actually prefer? Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about here. Um, Okay, so we're all good. This is no questions for me, but do please ask because this is like really important. So there are many, so what, what gives you zero reconstruction error is any interpolating solution. And I'm saying there are many different interpolating solutions. Okay, and the question is which ones of them is actually the one that an autoencoder learns. And so let me give you intuition. Um, so let's actually do exactly this. So this is now a unit autoencoder trained on one single example, one training example. And what you see, is that in fact, what it learned is the point map, okay? So anything you put in, whatever other test example you put in, out comes your training example, okay? Even if you put in random noise, out comes your training example. So it certainly didn't learn anything that is close to the identity map. It learned more something that is close to the projection, even more extreme, right? It didn't learn the projection. It actually learned the point map, which is something different than the projection. Okay, now, and some people tell me, well, this is what I would have expected. Well, then let me show you the following, that this is maybe not what you should have expected, but maybe it should be, but like, let me show you why it is actually surprising. Um, so first of all, it is surprising because there are infinitely many solutions, right? This is just one of them is the point map um, that came out. And in particular, if you would take a shallow autoencoder, you would not get this. Okay, so UNET is actually, it's, it's already quite deep. If you do a shallow autoencoder, you actually get back something that basically learns something very similar to an identity map. Okay, you see here, I trained it on one training example and I put in something else and out comes basically itself, right? So it can learn something that is quite close to the identity map. And in particular, if you take a linear um, autoencoder and now you train it on two training examples, you see that it does something like a projection. So now you actually get linear combinations of your training examples. Okay, so you can get like things like a dog and an and, and, uh, and, um, airplane mixed up here. So it's really quite special that actually the point map comes out and not a linear combination of, of your training example, which could then you know, change based on, on the colors, right? Um, so, so I think it is surprising and I think there is definitely something um, to actually be understood. And now I should go to the Q&A and there are definitely questions. Um, sorry, uh, so maybe one of you guys who is moderating, could you ask me just the questions? There are so many in here, which ones I should answer. I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, Pavlos, do you wanna take care of that? Yeah. Yes, I could. Um, so there's a question is about if you can change the activation function, it will matter to your performance. Great questions. And uh, it will not matter for this particular behavior that you'll see. 
um, that these autoencoders are attractive and it will matter for some things and I'll get back to that as an open problem. So there was another question in the chat. It's a little bit confusing with the chat. Uh, someone asked you if this is like a support vector machine because you have the higher dimension. Is there any relation to that? Um, That's uh, interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. And we can talk about it afterwards when I'm showing you how this actually okay. works. Yeah. Um, cool. You can continue, Caroline. I'll look at them and I'll summarize them next time. Perfect. Okay, that would be really okay, helpful. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Great, good. Okay, so, so this is why um, it might be surprising. And so now I have to show you what is actually happening, right? I should go back here and kind of explain um, what is actually happening. Okay, um, so how do we analyze this? And this will actually give a lot of intuition. So let's take this, um, oh, sorry. Maybe you have to mute yourself. We hear some, or I hear at least background. Perfect, thank you. So, so let's take this shallow network. Okay, the standard shallow networks, um, or you know, a network trained on more than one example, um, where you also know if you've done this with autoencoders, right? In general, they don't just give you out the point map. In general, it's not the case that one of your training examples comes out, but it looks more like this, right? That whatever you put in, something very similar gets reconstructed. Um, but let me show you that although this looks kind of like the identity map, it's actually not the identity map. And, and I'll show you how this works and, and how we got the right intuition, I guess, for what we wanted to then prove is the following. So the nice thing about autoencoders is that it's a map from RD to RD, right? So input dimension, output dimension is the same. So what I can do is take whatever came out and put it back in through the map, right? So I train the map on some training examples and I learned some map. And now I take a new example and um, I just, you know, a test example, I put it through my autoencoder, basically like what we did here, right? You take a test example, you put it through your autoencoder, out comes something, looks quite similar, right? But now let me just iterate and see what happens. Well, and if you do that, um, you'll see that in fact, at the end, you'll get out one of your training examples. And that's exactly what we did here, okay? So uh, we trained our autoencoders um, with, you know, in this case, I think it was 500 training examples. Okay, and then we take these training examples and we add a huge amount of noise on top of it. So here you see, for example, we add like 50% of it is noise. And now, you know, you iterate your training examples many times. So after you iterate once, basically, you know, this here comes out again, right? You can't really tell the difference. You iterate it many, many, many times and you see that out comes your training example. Okay, so this is quite interesting, right? Um, so what does, and here you see how often actually your training example comes out. So obviously it's over parameterized. So for the training examples, your training example comes out, there is zero reconstruction error. But you see that in most cases, right, we're actually able to get back our training example. So what does this mean? Um, so this means that our training examples are attractors, right? And that there is a basin of attraction around them that is something reasonable because whenever we, you know, add noise to that particular training example in general, even if you add quite a lot of it, many of the times actually your training example comes out. Now, this is where your question about um, the activation function matters. So these regions of attraction depend on the activation function, okay? And I'll have a lot of open questions around this at the end because I think it is really important to understand. So here you see it, right? So this is here, um, we did in 2D, our points are now, <laughs> they're not images, they're just two dimensional points. And we actually uh, uh, then you know, ran it on a grid and saw where these points are going to be attracted to. So these are our training examples here. And you see here in color are all of the points that actually um, end up, um, they converge to this particular training example. These guys here all converge to this one, et cetera. So these are the, the basins of attraction around each training example. Um, and so, um, and you see that, you know, this is not some like Euclidean ball around it or something like that, right? And this actually will depend really heavily on, on the activation function that you're using. But that you have this attractor phenomena does not depend on the activation function. Um, so that's where it enters in. Hey, Caroline, there's a couple of questions about the, the mapping. One is that, uh, is the point map a linear map? And Alex asking, what do you exactly mean by point map? Can you repeat those? Can you? Clarify on those. Perfect. Okay, let me um, say that. So a point map is a map that maps everything to one point. So that's not linear. Um, so the projection would be that it would map it to the line through that point. Okay, in particular, then it would map zero to zero. That would be the linear map through my training example. 
Um, but you saw that you know the point map is different, namely it even maps zero to the point itself, to the training example. Um, and so here you see that what it actually did is learn the point map where it maps whatever you put in to the same point. Um, and it doesn't map it to a scaling of the point, which would mean that zero would still get mapped to zero. If you use a linear autoencoder, that's what will happen. Zero will still be mapped to zero. So that's the difference. And that's a great question. Caroline, I'm just gonna ask, uh, um, Alex who asked the question wanted to actually ask it in person. So Alex, you should be- uh, you should uh, Thank you, is it working? Yeah, hi Caroline, this is great. Um, of course, I know the work, it's beautiful, but a clarifying question. Um, so our, it seems that you're now saying that it's not learning the point map exactly, but it's uh, it's learning a map that when when composed with itself many times converges to uh, something like a point map, although it's actually um, point map for different points on different basins of attraction. So, so what did you mean by the original statement that it's learning? Great. A yeah. So actually, if you go as if you go deeper and deeper, it will become the point map. Um, so here, the more overparameterized you are, the more it will become the point map. So that's why here it looks like a point map. Yeah. I see. Uh, okay. Okay. And here it's not yet the point map. But um, if I overparameterize it enough, um, you'll see. You don't oh, need I to think. iterate. So the more overparameterized it is, the less I have to iterate. And I'll okay. Okay. That program. that's that that's the part I missed. Thank you. And I'll give you the theory, right? For now, I'm just giving you experiments. Yeah. Um, and I just have you believe. Um, and now I'll go into the theory. <laughs> but I, I, we did a lot of experiments. So no, no, that's good. I, I was just a question about the phenomenology. So thank you. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so um, this is also something interesting that, so, okay. So what you can prove um, when you have a map like this is you can prove that an example is, a, is an attractive fixed point, right? By just looking at the eigenvalues that map, right? If, if like your largest one is smaller than one, then you know that you're a an attractive fixed point. So we can prove for all these points that they are attractive fixed points. Um, so now let me show you that we can also do, you know, quite large examples. We, I think we also have this on a thousand examples where we can make a network that has all of these examples be attractive fixed points. And you can just check that right on the map. So we know that they're all attractive fixed points. And what is really interesting is that we actually did not find any other fixed points. Okay, now this is not something we can prove. So we just did you know, a whole lot of different test examples, all kinds of noises, all kinds of you know, like really random crazy examples and we just iterate from them. And always we got out a training example. Now it looks like, right, this is a network that was trained that doesn't have any other fixed points, but it would be really nice to prove something like this. Okay, so this is, again, this is just experimental that there are no other fixed points. Um, and again, here I put uh, the nonlinearity that we're using um, because this matters. So the nonlinearity will also have a great effect in terms of how quickly you actually get all of your examples to be fixed points and that you don't see many other fixed points as well. Okay, so now comes the theorem. Um, and this is the, the one theorem that we're able to prove. Um, so this is a theorem that tells you that the, what I, all, everything I told you actually holds and we can prove it for one training example, okay? And so this is one training example. You can have depth and you can have nonlinearities. And we have a formula depending on, you know, whatever your depth is and whatever your width is, whatever your nonlinearity is. Um, so based on the nonlinearity um, and then the formula will give you the formula for the, for the largest eigenvalue. And you need this to be smaller than one at your training example, right? For it to be an attractive fixed point. And so you have the formula of what this, what this, eigen, what this eigenvector is. And then, you know, you just have to increase the depth and the width and you can show that it will always be, come out. You can choose it in such a way that it will always come out to be smaller than one. Okay, so that's um, the theorem. And so how you should think about it is in this way. And I think this explains like the whole um, phenomenon. And I will get back to one of the questions that someone asked at the beginning. There is no regularization here. So probably you're familiar with work by Joshua Benjo, um, you know, very early on where they actually added a regularizer to autoencoders to make them attractors, okay? To make them contractive, um, contractive maps because it was already saw, seen then in applications that it's a good phenomenon to be attract, to have the training points be attractors. And so they added regularization to do this. And what we're showing here is that you don't need regularization. Overparameterization is going to take care of that. 
Okay, so the more you over-parameterize, the more you're actually anyways going to become contractive at your training examples. So an autoencoder over-parameterization actually is a self-regularizing. Okay, so the autoencoder becomes self-regularizing. It, it regularizes itself so that it becomes more and more attractive at the fixed points until, and now comes the question, until it becomes a point map. And this is the point map, right? So, so if you have a map like this that is contractive and I iterate it many times, right? So at the training examples, my, my largest eigenvalue is smaller than one. You iterate this many times, out comes the point map. And so more depth will actually already point you more towards a map that looks like this, like which is a point map. Um, and so how we should see this is really, you know, the autoencoder could have learned a crazy function. It could have learned some random, you know, function. All it has to do is interpolate the training examples. But actually what it learns, so what gradient descent makes sure that will happen is that it learns a map that is um, a contractive at the training examples, meaning that when you iterate it, actually something like this comes out. Okay, so it is really self-regularizing. Um, and I think that's quite nice that you actually don't need to add any regularizers to get this phenomenon that was already appreciated, you know, many years ago as something that is um, something that is beneficial for um, for an autoencoder. OK, so 221. Um, so I already got a lot of questions. So um, let me tell you a little bit about, you know, this has, of course, um, uh, has also problems, right? So it's very good for the application and I'll get to the drug application. But if you think about privacy, um, might be a bit problematic, right? Because it means that if you give me a trained autoencoder, I just put in noise um, and I can recover your training examples. So you may not want to share autoencoders that are trained among different hospitals, for example, right? Um, but it also has quite interesting um, implications for, for memory um, because this kind of shows that it is, um, it might be actually, or it is a different way of actually thinking about how to come up with associative memory, right? And, and I will show you something, and now we're going more into the application um, to neuroscience. Um, so, you know, we know that, I mean, for humans, it's easier to memorize a whole sequence than it is to memorize single instances of images, say, for example, images or events. And so we can, instead of doing what we did until now, which is map an image to an image or, you know, some point to a point, we can use the autoencoding framework as a sequence encoder, where say you have a hundred images, okay? And all I'm doing is I'm, instead of memorizing training on each one of the hundred images, I'm going to train to map image one to image two, image two to image three, image three to image four, image 100 back to image one, okay? And, well, then you have a sequence encoder. And what is really quite amazing, and this is what we did, we did it on speech, we did it on, on videos. Um, and um, you can actually memorize whole Mickey Mouse movies um, in this way. So here you see, we trained it on a Mickey Mouse movie um, and we start in random noise um, and you see it goes really fast. So, you know, this is the, the, the noise, right? And you just, you just let it run, right? So you just iterate it. And, and you see that it already is back into the Mickey Mouse movie where it was trained on. And so now it will just iterate through it. Um, so, you know, you can, you can memorize whole movie sequences. You can even memorize, um, you can even memorize two sequences at the same time. So you'll see that one is actually counting downwards and one is counting upwards. And it's actually not jumping around between the two. Although, you know, the number three in one sequence is very similar to the number three in the other sequence. You see that, you know, they're all like happily moving between them. Um, and how you should think about it is in this way. Um, so, you know, like, let me go slowly through this. So here we trained it on, we have four sequences trained, the green, red, blue ones. And you just throw in some random initialization points like these black dots. And, and then you, they will all go somewhere. And you'll see that they all now start, you know, if you let it run longer and longer, and I have it here after letting it run very, very long, you see that they all nicely go in their own sequence and they're just continuing on, right? So this means that you can actually memorize five movies at the same time. And, you know, you'll, you'll always either be in this one movie or in that movie or in this movie or in this movie, and you're not going to get perturbed by all the other movies that are also playing. These, these, uh, these cycles and these attractor phenomena are really, really strong, okay? You're not going to be jumping around between the different ones, which is really quite nice as a memory kind of mechanism. Um, 
And it is in fact more efficient to memorize um, bio sequences than it is um, to memorize, you know, say a hundred images separately instead of actually memorizing them as a sequence. And you can prove this. Um, it's actually quite easy to prove. That's where the intuition came from for doing this, right? Because if you look at the eigenvalues, if you, you know, if you multiply them all up around the, sequ uh, around the cycle, um, then your chances of them becoming smaller than one is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that each one of them is smaller than one to get that the whole product is smaller than one. So it is in fact easier to memorize whole sequences than it is to memorize, um, to memorize single images themselves. So it's quite nice implications for memory as well. Um, and I will end um, by um, saying, okay, so maybe this I should say. So you can ask about what is the effect of increasing width versus increasing depth. Both of them lead to over parameterization. Here again, we don't have a proof, um, but this is what it seems to be doing. They seem to have different effects for increasing width versus increasing depth. So what happens with increasing depth is that the eigenvalues shift over, so they become smaller and smaller. Whereas what happens with increasing width is the variance reduces. So, so that means that right, both will help you in order to get the largest eigenvalue to be smaller than one. So you definitely want to have increased width so that you reduce the variance, right? So that your largest eigenvalue will hopefully pull in a bit. And then you have to have enough depth so that the whole support will move down below one. Okay, so this is something that we want to prove, of course, but, but this is what seems to be happening. What is the effect, the different effect of increasing width versus increasing depth? Um, and let me end by getting back to the, um, to, the, to the drug application, right? So I took a little bit of a detour, but I, this is just to show how important it is to actually understand, you know, the underlying um, machine learning models that you're using and how this can really provide intuition for actually figuring out a model that might sound in, unintuitive at the beginning, but actually leads to really nice results in terms of uh, finding um, drug signatures that generalize across cell types. Now, again, uh, we don't have a proof yet. Okay, so, so what I showed you before is that points, so training examples become attractors. Now we just extrapolated and hoped that maybe instead of just zero dimensional points, also one dimensional things will become attractors. Okay, so the drug signature is a one dimensional thing. And maybe if we're over parameterized, it is in fact the case that more similar drug signatures will become more similar to each other in this latent space. And that's in fact what is happening. So it would be nice to prove something that it's not just zero, it's anything lower dimensional will become more aligned. Okay, so it's also one dimensional things, two dimensional things, et cetera. Just anything lower dimensional will become more aligned. That's at least what it seems to be happening here. Um, and, you know, I'll just end by showing you that this can then be applied now once you have actually the drug signatures in the latent space, you can then figure out, right, you can now prioritize drugs based on which ones are most aligned, anti-correlated with the disease signature for that particular disease that you actually care about. You get out drugs and, and a rating or a ranking of these drugs. And then, you know, um, is all this part that I didn't talk about of all our algorithms to actually learn causal graphs and to really validate that the particular drugs and the targets that we find are really upstream of many of the genes that are in fact changed by the disease. And so if you do that among all these drugs um, and their targets, you actually get out one of the targets that is, you know, the most upstream of all of the, of all of the genes that are um, changed um, by the disease. And it's quite interesting, and this is not something that we added into the model, but this RIPK1, which is the target that we find, um, is in fact directly binds to SARS-CoV-2, um, which is certainly not something we put into the model. Um, and it has a very different effect in aged individuals versus young individuals, which is of course something that one sees with SARS-CoV-2, that it is, you know, its effect is highly, highly age dependent. And we also have a mechanism of how we think it could work. It's actually a really cool protein that, you know, is involved in either, um, you know, pathways that lead to death of the cell and also pathways that lead to um, immune response of the cell. So actually cell survival and cell death, depending on which part of the protein gets activated. And so this could explain, you know, how there are very different effects in aged individuals versus in, in young individuals with actually the same protein. It just has a very different downstream rule. Um, so this is something that we're very excited about also validating experimentally. And so with that, let me not give an overview, um, but actually get to the conclusions. Um, so 
I think it is really important to actually have a principled causal framework, right, for, for actually drug discovery, where, you know, you go from trying to figure out drug signatures that are generalizable across, uh, across cell types, and then also get to the mechanisms where you really try to figure out what could be the causal underpinning of how these drugs work. Um, so we showed a, a, a framework for using autoencoders to generalize across, um, across different cell types in terms of the effect of drugs. And to us, I mean, and this is this uh, mainly this work that I presented here that came out in PNAS um, last year. Um, to us, autoencoders are not just, you know, super useful in biology for data integration, translation, et cetera, but in particular also for studying just theoretical properties of neural networks. Um, and, you know, I showed that these overparameterized autoencoders, they show really remarkable self-regularization properties. They learn maps that are contractive at the training examples. Um, it provided us a new and biologically plausible mechanism for associative memory, biologically plausible because it just requires iterating the map. Um, and finally, I also showed this, right? There are, um, this also implies quite a lot of privacy issues in terms of um, these autoencoders and, and sharing of autoencoders. And, and this is the question that was brought up, um, a very good question about, about the, um, the role of the different activation functions. Here you see it. Um, so these are the interactor landscapes for different activation functions um, and how very different they look like. And I think it is really, really important for different applications that we really understand this better. Um, we need to, for now, we're only talking about autoencoding. We don't have the same um, results for classification. Um, we should have, and so this is something actually that maybe I didn't touch upon, but you know, like people use the word generalization when thinking about autoencoders, and usually they mean that a function or the map generalizes if it is close to the identity map, which I find not a, well, not a good definition because I don't even have to train an autoencoder in order to get the identity map, right? I can just put in the identity map. So that's certainly not a network that will generalize well. Um, so maybe the right definition is that it should be close to the identity map, but if you iterate it, it should actually be contractive at the training examples. That could be a definition of generalization that I think would make sense, but of course this requires quite a lot of more work. Um, and then this metric learned that I already said um, in the latent space. So I think a lot of open problems, um, but I think, you know, um, has like a lot of potential for many different applications. We're now always using these overparameterized autoencoders um, and a lot of theoretical questions as well. And with that, um, let me end and acknowledge, you know, an amazing group of people um, with whom we actually did this work. In particular, collaborators, uh, Misha Belkin for the PNAS paper and uh, Shiva's lab um, at ETH for the, for the drug repurposing paper, um, which just came out in NatureCom. And then of course, funding without which, it, you know, none of this would have been possible. And thank you all um, for your attention and the many really great questions. Um, you kind of already saw what was going to come. So that's always the best when people ask these kinds of questions. Thank you, Caroline. I think there is maybe time for a couple of questions. I know we're almost at the time, but uh, there is two questions on the Q and A, two or three questions. Uh, one is what is the intuition behind the fact that overparameterized autoencoders are self-regularizing? Uh, that's uh, Parmite is asking for some intuition, and Alexandrina is asking uh, if, when you show the movies, instead of starting from some random noise, what if you start from a random frame? Oh, okay, good. Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, let me take the second one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the second one first. So if you just start from a ra random frame, you'll just start going around from there. So um, if I go back to my movies. So um, starting from a random frame would be the same as just starting in one of these points. And then you just move around like this because it was trained because then you have you're, you're already in the sequence. So you have reconstruction error zero. Um, so you will for sure just move, continue moving around because it was trained as a sequence. Um, so the interesting thing is that if you start anywhere, you know, you could also think that maybe you're going to move out, that there is some other attractor somewhere else. But, you know, we showed also before, right, in these other examples, that it seems like this attractor phenomenon is so strong that you're actually going to converge to one of these sequences. And then you'll just be stuck in that sequence. Um, so that's um, that question. And then the one before, yeah. So what is the intuition? How did we start off? I guess um, we started off, and that's why I show these, 
I'm not able to move back anymore. Um, okay, here. So that's why I kind of showed these examples because this is really how we start on and how we build intuition is by observing this. So we always try to do everything as simple as possible. Um, so we really started with one training example and then you kind of get to see this phenomenon that you, you actually learn the point map and then you, know, you get to see that, well, maybe that's not what we should have expected in general, right? Because, you know, if I have something very shallow then this is not what happens. And in particular, we got a lot of intuition from the linear setting. So if you do one example linear, you actually get this projection. So you get you know, a linear combination of your image and zero, basically. Um, and when you do two examples, you get the, the projection onto you know, a linear combination of these. And so that's really where, it, and then you know, for the linear setting, actually quite a lot of theories known, right? Of, because then you're in the regression setting. And so then um, theories already known that, that gradient descent will actually give you out this projection. So then the whole thing is about how do you actually say something about the nonlinear setting? And the nonlinear setting seems so much more interesting because it is this point map thing and not a linear combination. So this is where the intuition came from and then, then just trying to prove things. Yep. And this, I guess, you know, like once you have this, then you're basically done, right? Then you know what you have to prove. So experiments are at, um, for building intuition. Very, very careful experiments. I think this is something that we should do in, in EECS. Um, I think it is becoming more and more of an experimental science. And I think there is a lot we could learn from, say, for us, I mean, since I work a lot with biologists, from biologists um, who always get training in how to perform really careful experiments so that you don't generalize just from one example, but that you actually build very, very careful experiments so that you get to the right conjectures. Oh, hi. Um, well, so the, the, the kind of question, oh, great talk, by the way, this was really Thank fascinating. Uh, the the over-parameterized these was a, a kind of a surprising twist. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any tips for training them. Um, like, do you usually stop when you hit zero training loss or are there sort of benefits for, for these kind of attractor points to keep going beyond that interpolation point? Um, yep, these are really great questions. Um, okay, so so let me, and this is really good. So, so let me go to um, the intuition, I think, for what we actually use in practice. And what we also did in the drugs comes from something again that we don't have to prove for, which is this. So, which is the thing about what width does and what depth does. So I think, so if it is true that depth just kind of moves everything over, and width kind of reduces the variance. Um, then, so you don't want to have, so, so I think a map that you, do, what you want to have as a map is not a point map where whatever you put in one of your training examples it immediately comes out. That's what you get when you do too deep. Okay, so too over parameterized in terms of depth is that that's what the map is that comes out. You may want this for particular applications, which is about, you know, I don't know, you have um, different defects that you want to identify and like, you know, are you going to be mapped to this or to that? Maybe there are applications where you would want that. But a lot of width might actually be something that you do want to have because you're still remaining. So you're, uh, what you would like to have is all of your eigenvalues be close to one, right? So that it's like the identity map, but that it is still kind of attractive at all of your training examples. And so reducing variance and making the ver and making the and shifting the distribution just so that it is just a little bit smaller than one is probably something that you like to have for many applications, right? That whatever test example I put in, something very similar comes out, but still I am actually a tractor, I, I am contractive at all of my training examples. And so that's that's the kind of thing um, how we're trying to go about it. So not too deep so that, you know, like the attractor phenomenon is too strong, right? You don't want to immediately get out one of your training examples, but you still want all of your training examples to be attractors. I hope that provides the right intuition. So usually more wide, um, over parameterized more through width than through depth for many applications. It does, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, does this mean that you kind of need to limit the number of training examples that you give? Is this like not a sort of domain where like the yes. usual data augmentation tricks are actually useful? It's actually very good. And you know, like we had this, like we were always saying, yes, this means you should throw away data. And it does mean that. And, and you know, because if you don't have enough computational power, you should throw it away. And we were like, okay, this is so obvious from these results that we probably don't need to write a paper about it. And you know that there was a paper about this, I think by Google or something. Yes, you should throw away data. And yes, because you need to be over parameterized. You, you want this phenomenon to happen. And you're completely right. This is what this means. And they showed it, yeah. All right. 
Um, let's thank uh, Caroline again. Uh, it was a fascinating you. talk. Um, so, well, um, hope we'll see you again next week. Uh, and thanks again, Caroline. And everybody. Yeah, thank you very much for the, for the invitation and for all the great questions. It was really fun. Great. Bye.